This program was funded in part by a grant from the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky. Welcome to Healing Childhood Trauma, a KET special report. I'm Renee Shaw. Thank you for joining us. Deeply embedded in the American narrative is a belief that you can overcome any obstacle with hard work and determination. American folklore is full of the stories of people who rose from rags to riches and were only made stronger by their hard scrabble beginnings. But an increasing body of science is showing us that for many people, Adversity and trauma in childhood biologically alter their perceptions of the world and ability to thrive and make healthy choices. And not only that, those adverse experiences can trigger hormonal imbalances and chronic inflammation that lead to shorter, sicker lives. The good news is, is that this trajectory can be changed with intervention. But first, we must recognize that there is a problem. These are turbulent times for sure. COVID-19 has put an X-ray on the fractures in our society. Recent protests have opened many Americans' eyes to the ongoing wounds of systemic racism. Now more than ever, our collective public health demands that we understand more about trauma, both its deep roots in childhood and hurtful legacy. We begin tonight with a look at what's been called the most important public health study you've never heard of. It's known as the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. The year is 1985. The location, Kaiser Permanente Medical Care Program in San Diego. Dr. Vincent Felitti, the medical director of a large program designed to help obese patients lose weight, is facing a puzzling problem. Just when many of his patients have begun to lose a noticeable amount of weight, they drop out of the program. He decides to meet with patients one-on-one -on -one to determine why. The answers are startling. He discovers that many of his patients had been sexually abused as children, and he realizes that for some of his patients, excess eating and weight gain are not simply a matter of lack of control or education. They are, in fact, a protective mechanism and a way of coping with the bad experiences from their past. After partnering with Dr. Robert Anda at the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Ferlitti's investigation was expanded to cover 17,000 largely middle-class adult patients in the Kaiser Permanente system. The survey asked them about their history with 10 different potentially adverse childhood experiences, known as ACEs, grouped in three categories. Abuse, physical, emotional, sexual. Neglect, physical and emotional and household dysfunction, mental illness, incarcerated household member, a mother who was treated violently, substance abuse, and divorce. For each type of adverse childhood experience, the person was given a point, and the points were tallied. For instance, a person whose parents were divorced and whose father was incarcerated and suffered from addiction received an ACE score of three. Again, the researchers could not believe what they found. 67% had at least one ace. Over 20% had three or more aces. 11% experienced five or more categories. The researchers determined that higher ACE scores correlated with an increase in risk for problems like substance abuse, smoking, and depression. And also for physical health problems like cancer, diabetes, stroke, and heart disease. And here's the most surprising part. Adverse childhood experiences make a person more susceptible to adult diseases, regardless of coping behaviors like smoking or substance abuse. Preventing disease, then, goes beyond exercising, eating right, and getting good medical care. It means reducing adverse childhood experiences. The ACE study demonstrated that childhood trauma and adversity is much more prevalent than most people ever thought and has significant impact on both mental and physical health throughout the lifespan. In Kentucky, 25.8 percent of children have experienced two or more ACEs. We rank 42nd in the nation for prevalence of ACEs. 
This affects our health care system, our schools, our prisons, our workforce, and comes with huge financial costs. Recently, I was honored to interview Dr. Vincent Felitti himself about this groundbreaking study and what we all can learn from it, both as individuals and as a state. Dr. Felitti, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate being able to connect with you. Well, you're quite welcome. Your study really focused and included white Caucasian middle class folks. And so when we think about in terms of the applicability of the ACES study to the population as a whole, why was it important to start or use that particular segment of the population? Well, that's what we had. Um, the population that we had uh, in Kaiser Permanente um, the huge medical organization, I don't know if the name is, is known in, in Kentucky, but uh, Kaiser Permanente is a nationwide medical care uh, system that has approximately 12 to 13 million members in it. So everybody obviously has high-end medical insurance. 74% uh, of the people had been to college, et cetera. Now, is that descriptive of every population in the world? My God, no. But given what we learned, if things are this bad in a clearly middle-class population, they surely don't get better. You know, if you're a recent immigrant from some war-torn corner of the earth, if you're part of an oppressed minority, if you're in, living in poverty on the street, etc. Our study demonstrates that the unhealthy behaviors that we see in adults really could be coping strategies and mechanisms that come from traumatic experiences during their childhood. So can you talk a little bit more about that? A recurrent theme in the obesity program was for people to flee at some point and regain all of their weight quickly. I have a number of television interviews with patients, uh, video interviews with patients, where they make the point that obesity was protective. My wall was crumbling. You know, I don't want bariatric surgery because what would I do if I needed to be fat again? So that was the beginning of a whole series of counterintuitive observations that what was being perceived as the problem in public health certainly was a problem from a societal standpoint, but from the standpoint of the individual involved was often an unconsciously attempted solution to problems that we knew nothing about. Dr. Felitti, for those adults who are watching this program tonight and they recognize that perhaps they have a significant number of ACEs and are challenged about what to do next, what would you say to them right now? What should they do? Well, <clears throat> One thing that's a reasonable starting point is to start writing an autobiography of your life in five-year segments. And if you have a computer, you can put that on the computer, you know, in, in a password-protected file. Uh, and that way you can go back and, you know, make additions to things that you hadn't thought about before, etc. Just to, to set the story straight in your own mind. And the question then comes, well, how much trouble are those things causing me now? Um, and if that's a serious problem, then the obvious approach would be psychotherapy. The problem with that is that psychotherapy, while a very effective approach, is also an inefficient approach. It's very time consuming, hence costly, hence unaffordable to a large number of people. Uh, and uh, we found an alternative uh, was hypnotherapy. But if you can find an experienced hypnotherapist who's had experience working in medical situations, that can often be very useful because sometimes significant symptomatic relief can be attained in a very small number of visits, hence affordably. But a really good starting point is the autobiographical writing. Uh, that's been studied well and, uh, you know, obviously has no cost attached to it. A great deal of advance can be made starting that way.
journaling, I think many people would refer to it as. So l looking at children, you know, what are some of the protective factors that can reduce the impact of ACEs and mitigate the impact of ACEs on children? What would you recommend yeah. there? That, that's a key point. Having access to a supportive adult, you know, with luck, it could be somebody in the family, maybe a grandparent, what have you, could be a school teacher, um, you know, any, it could be a minister, if, if you're a churchgoer, et cetera. Um, any supportive adult can be very, very meaningful. The old television program, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, mm -hmm. was an excellent you know, uh, um, example of that, because in a way that program really had its function by supplying a supportive adult into the lives of many children who did not have such a person. Kentucky is in the top 10 states in the prevalence of ACEs. So what would you, Dr. Felitti, say to policymakers and others who may be thinking about policy or systemic changes that could help bring those numbers down? I, I would suggest that they do what 23 other states have already done to pass legislation. Well, you know, first, obviously, to get the people of the legislature uh, aware of, of what we found and then pass legislation designed to support the routine collection of this information in everyday medical practice. For instance, in California, the legislature has passed legislation now uh, putting up several hundred million dollars to A, disseminate information about the ACE findings throughout the state to the public, and B, to provide an extra payment for any physician who is seeing a Medi-Cal patient who collects the ACE information and records it. Any physician who does that in California now will have $29 added to his fee, whatever it would have been for seeing that patient. So that has been a big step forward in terms of, you know, really getting this disseminated on a, on a wide scale. In, in medicine, it has slowly gathered attention and acceptance, starting in pediatrics. Uh, adult medicine, you know, largely avoidant at the present time. You know, that, that'll, that'll change, uh, but it may take years, if not a couple of decades, for that to change meaningfully. In pediatrics, it's really, it's really catching on with the American Academy of Pediatrics, pushing it, and, and so forth. An important point is how one gets this information. I mean, this is really a key point. <clears throat> if you attempt to get it face-to-face, -face, that's likely to fail. Because all of us, having you know, learned all our lives that certain things one doesn't talk about, incest being one, or ask questions about, we found it was we're likely to do it clumsily the first few times, and then decide, no, the hell with this, um, you know, that, that's not what I do. I'm a cardiologist or gastroenterologist or surgeon or what have you. What we found was that when we entered these questions and blended them into a 10-page medical history questionnaire filled out at home, not in the waiting room, that was highly accepted to patients. Many patients used to stop me in the hall on their way home at the end of visit two to thank me for asking, quote, those questions. Mm -hmm and then go on to say how grateful they were that the examiner was still nice to them after hearing the dark secrets of their lives. Hmm. And I thought it was an important thing that asking initially by inert, an inert mechanism, and in the exam room then, he would say to a patient, I see on the questionnaire that you were the one who discovered your father's body when he hanged himself. You were repeatedly molested as a kid, et cetera. Can you tell me how that's affected you later in your life? And we listened, period. No humbug about, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That must have been awful, et cetera. No, we listened, period. And we did one other thing. We implicitly accepted that person by wanting to see them come back again, you know, and his patients in the hall would tell me, you know, they were really nice to me, they want to see me again, et cetera. 
as though they were expecting, you know, some disastrous response mm -hmm. to learning these childhood experiences. Yeah. Very That's important. Very I'm glad you shared that, Dr. Felitti. Uh, just in a final question to you, are there any misconceptions about the study that you'd like to set the record straight on? I, I don't think the real issue is misconception. The real issue is, you know, ignorance of the study or its findings, which is still fairly widespread, uh, major discomfort uh, with dealing with those findings uh, and, and hence avoidance, those, those are, the, are the main issues. Thank you, Dr. Vincent Felitti, for your time and your expertise and your contributions in this area. We really appreciate it. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you. We owe Dr. Felitti a debt of gratitude for his humanity and courage as he explored these complex issues and helped expose the widespread prevalence of trauma in childhood. Because of the ACE study, clinicians are beginning to ask, what happened to you, instead of, what's wrong with you? One of the most startling revelations from the study was the role that adverse childhood experiences had on physical health later in life. We asked Dr. Timothy Anger, an assistant professor of neurology at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine, to explain how the body reacts to stressful events physiologically and what happens when our internal alarm system is always on. Just like in nature, the brain itself is extremely lazy, for lack of a better term, and it likes to operate at a homeostatic level. This concept of homeostasis is when the engine is running, but it's sort of idling comfortably. All the processes are working, but there's no stress on the system. This is the brain's favorite way to function because it doesn't have to exert extra energy or extra chemicals in one direction or another. And its perpetual goal, in theory, is to continually return to homeostasis. Uh, there are certain areas in the brain, certain cellular structures that are responsible for sensing when there is stress upon the system, when there is something to which it needs to respond, and then they release certain neurotransmitters and call up for an overproduction of particular chemicals in an effort to rid the system of the stress and return itself to homeostasis. So let's say you're casually strolling along and you see something that startles you. You see a bear. When the hypothalamus in the brain indicates that there is a stress response that needs to needs to be enacted upon. It communicates with the limbic system. What it does is it releases a trigger hormone to the adrenal glands, which release cortisol. That is the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Your body goes through a series of lightning fast reactions that prepare you to respond to this scenario in a number of possible ways. Are you going to fight the bear or are you going to run away from the bear? Your pupils dilate to increase your depth of field of vision so you can see and appreciate more data in your surroundings. Your heart rate will increase to pump more oxygenated blood into your system as a whole. Your blood pressure will increase to accommodate the excess load so we can move in oxygen around all the muscles throughout your body. Your muscles will tense up and prepare to either engage legs and run in one direction or say engage arms and fight in the other. Um, your body will release an increase in glucose, so your blood sugar will increase. Your uh, bronchi in your lungs will react so they can be prepared for an increase in oxygen. Basically, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, and your body gets tense. After the emergency or the event is over, the, the body's supposed to then engage the compensatory mechanism, which is the parasympathetic nervous system, which provides the reversal of a lot of the stimulus that we talked about before, decreasing the heart rate, um, changing back the bronchi to bring in normal amounts of oxygen, lowering the blood pressure, those types of things. And that's an effort to return the mind, the body to homeostasis. That's the normal operation. Stress in acute incidences is a good developmental response. You need to have that fight or flight mechanism as a safety mechanism. When it's not good is when it becomes maladaptive and you live in an environment that's perpetually causing you to be stressed out. If we're talking about children who live in unstable environments or children who are perpetually subject to rapid changes or things that would impact their normal functioning and they're unable to establish routines or they have unstable housing or they have health crises and they're perpetually activating that stress response. They can be conditioned to it 
and they may think that they're learning to work in the environment, but what's really happening is their body is just fooling them into getting more comfortable with a perpetually heightened level of stress. The impact of being in a perpetually stressful environment, whether you're aware of it or not, is not only troublesome, it's systemic, and it impacts multiple areas of the body and how the body functions. What it does to the organ system is it eventually starts to erode core functions in the organ system and erode linings um, at a much faster rate, and that raises the proclivity for someone to develop chronic health conditions. When you think about your body is now programmed to raise your heart rate and raise your blood pressure and constrict your breathing for a very small stimulus or as a chronic concern, that leads to chronic hypertension or coronary artery disease or heart rate issues, um, which can be major risk factors for stroke or cerebrovascular compromise later in life. Digestive tract systems, like we mentioned, you can develop ulcers. Even inflammatory responses. When your body gets used to being under duress, you could become more prone to develop an autoimmune disorder as well. So putting this information out there and being proactive about knowing what your stress limits are, knowing what your triggers are, and knowing what your effective coping mechanisms are, it's like being prepared for the race a week in advance. You can prepare yourself for how to handle stress and prepare yourself to do it in a much more evolved way, rather than overreacting and potentially engaging in an unhealthy coping mechanism. Anna Polgears was one of 10 winners of the National Institute of Health's Speaking Up About Mental Health contest last year. In her essay, Anna wrote about her experience in and out of foster homes as a young child, facing extreme punishment measures and a series of adults who couldn't commit to caring for her. Instead of turning to anger with the help of her adoptive mom, Connie, Anna was able to process her experiences and label herself as bent, not broken. We spoke with Connie and Anna, a recent Campbell County High graduate, to hear more about their commitment to transforming childhood trauma into an opportunity to help others who may be bent, not broken, just like Anna. I like to call myself bent and not broken because what I believe, like, I believe that what I've been through has made me a stronger person and now I realize I can handle anything that life throws at me. Being mistreated as a child, it did not make me mad or angry. It just made me want to be more compassionate towards other people and that I can understand what someone else is going through. There's a big misconception out there where um, people think that, that children who have suffered from ACEs or just grown adults that have suffered from ACEs are broken. I think that it's time that people start looking at it differently, that, you know, they are the strong ones. They are the ones that give us perspective. Um, being an educator, I knew a lot about um, childhood trauma and and how it impacts so much. And so I, I made sure that, um, you know, I found children's books to read about you know, certain situations in foster care and um, what it was like to be in foster care and, um, you know, just made sure that she had an opportunity early on to um, learn how to become resilient and learn that it was nothing to be ashamed of and that she could take it and, and use it to her benefit to become a stronger person. You know, whenever they were little, I had this this yardstick, and it was an old wooden yardstick from uh, where I grew up in Maysville. And um, I would talk about, you know, you see these four inches on this yardstick. That's the beginning of your life where you went through a lot of pain and a lot of bad things happened. And that wasn't your choice. But if you let, you know, these four inches impact the rest of your life, then that is your choice. And so we talked a lot about um, not playing a victim and uh, not feeling sorry for yourself, but using your story to help others and using it to propel you onto great things. 
So I'm planning on going to the University of Cincinnati and studying in neurobiology and neuroscience to later become a physician so that I can be able to help others through what I've been through. And I'm fascinated with how the brain works. And I know that the brain controls everything and that the more that I can learn about the brain, the more, like, the better doctor I will be about emotional health. I hope that she can be an example that that children with ACEs and children that um, are in foster care are not throwaways. You know, we could have the next great neurosurgeon sitting here, and um, you know, if if we hadn't given her the chance, then um, maybe that would never have happened. So I, I wish more people would open their hearts and homes. Uh, we have a huge need in Kentucky, over 10,000 children in foster care. And, um, you know, you can see what, what they can turn out to be. It's clear that Anna has a bright future ahead of her, and we thank her and her mother, Connie, for sharing their story with us. No family lives in total isolation. We are all influenced by the community in which we live. How much does that impact our ability to overcome our personal adversity? We spoke about the impact of community on child and family well-being with Dr. Wendy Ellis, who's the director of the Center for Community Resilience at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University. She's been working with local health departments in Covington and Louisville to help address root causes of adversity with a model that she calls the pair of ACEs. Dr. Ellis, thank you so very much for your time. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Well, thank you for having me. In recent years, we've heard a lot about the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, and the long-term effects on, on toxic stress and trauma on an individual's mental and their physical well-being and health. But you felt that study didn't go far enough. Why? Well, it's not so much that the study didn't go far enough. It was simply based on a limited sample, you know, middle to upper class white women in an obesity clinic in California. And, and the study was important because it opened up a door of inquiry to help us to begin to draw associations between stress experienced in childhood and the development of chronic conditions across the lifespan. Now, those 10 ACEs represent the experience of a small but hardly representative population. And they do provide a basic understanding of the connection between childhood adversity and chronic disease. And if there are limitations to the original study, it's that, that study, those study subjects do not represent a cross-section of the U.S., particularly in gender, race, age, and income. And so it's not so much a criticism of Anna and Folletti's work as it's more of a recognition that there are a number of adverse childhood experiences that were not recognized in that original study, such as poverty, racism, and discrimination, because perhaps those experiences were not felt by that study's population. And so you created uh, the pair of ACEs model that gets to some of what you're speaking about. And so we're going to show a graphic right now. I want you to walk us through the image of this tree and explain to us what this means. Yeah, so, you know, I was really inspired by understanding, of course, these classic ACEs that were first described, maternal depression, emotion and sexual abuse, substance abuse, domestic violence, physical and emotional neglect, divorce, mental illness, and car parental incarceration, or homelessness. Now, these were the 10 classic ACEs that were um, described in the original studies. And so using the analogy of a tree, one could say, you know, they are like the branches and the leaves. We can easily assess perhaps the strength of a tree as we're walking in a park and are the branches strong enough to support our children? Will we allow them to climb up that tree? But perhaps what we don't necessarily readily assess are what are the nutrients in that soil that contributes to the out appearance of that tree. So when you apply that to individuals, if we're a teacher in a classroom and we see a child who is perhaps withdrawn and doesn't want to interact and socialize with its peers or perhaps is easily upset and, and has uh, negative behaviors or you know aggressive behaviors, perhaps you know we want to go towards just fixing the child. 
without really thinking about, well, what's really influencing that behavior? Is it because perhaps there's a lot of household instability because of the fact that perhaps one of his parents are incarcerated and that creates some level of economic you know, disruption within the home, or, or are they living in areas of concentrated poverty where there are fewer resources to help support the healthy development and perhaps even social development um, and control of emotions? Or is it, you know, that they live in poor quality housing or or there's constant community disruption due to violence? So it's it's really was helping to um, widen the conversation and broaden the understanding that we can't just focus on the outcomes, those things that we see on the branches and the leaves, without considering the context in which these adversities occur. And it was also really a way to get many people who are interested in child welfare and prevention of adversity to really thoughtfully and intentionally begin to focus on root causes. So let's talk about the roots of the tree, which are known as social determinants of health. Can you give us an example of how the issues and the roots then lead to issues with the branches? Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually, you know, as our work has deepened in community and systems, we've come to reframe these so-called social determinants of health mm -hmm. as really systems-driven community characteristics. So oftentimes these characteristics are less about individual choices or behaviors and more about the outputs and the outcomes of these various systems and sectors, particularly housing, public education, law enforcement, and criminal justice. So for example, the work that we're doing in Louisville is focused on the disproportionate rate of evictions in West Louisville, a neighborhood that is largely African-American and low income. If one were to take a traditional social determinant of health approach to this issue, we might only focus on financial management or job training, interventions directed at individuals. But when examining the root causes, we have to go much further upstream to examine the policies and the practices of the systems that are producing the evictions as a system's outcome. So as we continue to do this work with the Louisville Health Department, we're uncovering a complex of issues at both the state and local level that not only limit tenant rights, granting property owners this wide latitude to evict tenants, it's a system that's ripe for racial discrimination, but also a voucher system that concentrates poverty by limiting where voucher holders may rent. So in addition to state policies that actually promote these cycles, you also have a lack of economic mobility, a lack of affordable housing, and access to substance abuse or mental health treatment as factors that feed into the vicious cycle of eviction. So as you can see, unpacking the branch of homelessness or housing instability requires examination of multiple systems, housing, economic development, education, public health, and health care that actually contribute to these outcomes that we see at the individual and community level. So let's add another complication, and that's another layer of health uh, concern, and that's the pandemic, COVID-19. And I know that you had mentioned that you've customized the tree to focus on how disparate impacts on the African-American community and Hispanic community who are disproportionately affected uh, by COVID in terms of contracting the disease and even death. Tell us about how this other part of this tree that you've customized to address COVID on these two particular populations work. Yeah, I, you know, our work has been, has always had, because we're talking about the context of, of root causes, has always had at the center of our work you know, this conversations on equity in community. And certainly, you know, what COVID-19 has brought to the forefront, it's laid bare these longstanding inequities that we see in communities and what we call the, the pandemic within a pandemic. And so this has really brought to bear this, this, what is a necessary reckoning of the understanding that our systems were baked with white supremacy as a belief. And this is not talking about individuals in white robes and, you know, burning crosses under the cover of darkness, but it's more so a belief system that white males should dominate over all other races and genders. And so that is actually what has influenced all of our social policies, was baked into our Constitution. And certainly to this day, we see that how that plays out 
in most of our systems and our policies and our practices. So with COVID-19, what we began to see and what was very obvious was just understanding that all of these underlying inequities that we've seen before were just exacerbated. So, you know, for instance, these when we look at the viral load in infections that, you know, the hospitalization rates and the death rates that are disproportionate for people of color. I mean, there was a recent um, Journal of American Medicine report that indicated that African Americans, while only making 13 percent of the U.S. population, actually comprised 30 percent of the COVID-19 hospitalizations and 23% of the deaths. We've also seen that similarly represented in the Latino community and certainly very hard hit in our indigenous populations where, you know, 7% of the Navajo population in just one state has suffered the death amounts there. So, so again, when you are already, you know, under an undue burden of chronic disease, and the stressors that are associated with inequity, whether that be with poverty, unstable housing, food insecurity, and you have a very highly contagious um, virus, and as well as limited access to health care, when we talk about the disproportionate impact on employment um, that has particularly hit our communities of color, because they typically are more often employed in the service industry, which has taken a really disproportionate hit with regard to employment, um, then, of course, you're going to see a, a, a heavier burden of COVID-19 than you might see in some other uh, communities. Dr. Ellis, thank you so very much for your time. We really appreciate you and your work. Well, thank you for having me. As any gardener or planter knows, when a flower doesn't bloom or a plant doesn't grow, you must fix the soil, not the plant. With 22% of Kentucky children living in poverty, this is an important concept to keep in mind. We thank Dr. Ellis for her contributions to this field. COVID-19 has, of course, impacted all of us in ways we don't fully understand yet, and it's not over. As the beginning of the school year approaches and uncertainty still reigns, we spoke with Center College student Melissa Collins about the challenges of being in college right now and the connections she sees between the current plight of students and the findings of the ACE study. Melissa, thank you so very much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, I want to go back in time a little bit and rewind to that mid-March day when things really changed uh, for you and so many students across this nation, whether they're in K-12 through or college. But as being a, a college student, you're at Center College in Danville. Tell us about that experience of not having school in person, being a college student, but not being in college. What's been the hardest part of this experience? I would say um, being away from campus, definitely. I mean, I, I fell in love with Center um, because of the Center atmosphere and being on campus and the people at Center. And, you know, that's been my experience. And not having that every day, that was, that was definitely a struggle. And, and, you know, not being able to go in and knock on your professor's door and, and have, you know, a conversation with them about a question you have in class. So I think that was the hardest thing in trying to make that transition and with everything else that's going on in the world and, and not having, you know, that support system right there, you know, mm -hmm. on campus. And so. that leads me right to my next question, Melissa. You know, you are very concerned about others. You're an intern with the Kentucky Youth Advocates. You're a rising senior at Center, and you do care about how your other peers, who may not be in circumstances and situations as fortunate as you, how they may be coping and dealing. Can you t share with us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think, you know, prior to my internship with KYA, um, you know, I hadn't really thought much about, 
you know, how other people might be affected in different ways that I am. I mean, you know, I, I just, I guess I was consumed with our own center experience and kind of thinking, well, you know, I'm sure people are having similar experiences like I'm having, but, you know, that's not really the case. And, I, and I'm fortunate to have a family who, you know, loves me and who cares for me and supports me. And, you know, I have that, but I, I've come to realize that that might not necessarily be the case for all college students, um, even at center. Um, I think that we like to think that that's the case, but it might not necessarily be. And, you know, and I think that's what's so important is understanding that and, and breaking that myth and realizing that, you know, not everybody necessarily has someone. Um, so we, we, we need to understand that and, and, and offer support um, in that way. So. You contribute to a blog that is run by the Kentucky Youth Advocates, and you recently wrote an article for their website, and you say, I'm going to just kind of requote you here. You say, as time goes on, stressful home environments, social isolation, and other stressors, stressors resulting from the pandemic might begin to take a toll on the long-term health of current college students as a result of these traumatic experience. Talk to me about, you have written about ACEs, which not a, a whole lot of people, which we hope by the time they watch this program will learn more about, but talk to us about what you wrote and how it, the understanding that you have of ACEs impacts your thinking and approach to these issues about what you hope colleges and universities will think about as they reopen. So I've really been fascinated by this concept um, since I started my internship, and I, I wanted to sort of see if I could connect that to, you know, some of the experiences that maybe some college students might have been going through and, and wondering, you know, I'm no doctor by any means, but um, wondering how, you know, if, if this might be a thing that we, we see later on, mm -hmm. if this trauma that we might see as a result of the pandemic and, and the, the experience of being you know, having online classes from college um, might be a thing that we see later on in life. But I think what's great about understanding ACEs is, you know, seeing how we can then prevent these health risks from actually happening. Um, and I think that's where colleges and universities can come in and help our students once we get back in the fall, whether that's in person or online, whatever that might look like, having resources available for our students, um, I think is going to make all the difference in how we come out even stronger after this. Well, Melissa, good luck to you uh, as you mm -hmm. forge into this new semester at Center. We wish you the absolute best and not just your academic pursuits, but in health. Thank you. I appreciate it. We thank Melissa for her wise assessment of the potential impact of this current crisis on students across the state and the need for schools and colleges to compassionately address the mental and physical health challenges that they may be facing. To help put all this information together, I spoke with three experts in the field, Dr. Jenny Sprang, Executive Director of the UK Center on Trauma and Children, Marta Miranda Straub, Commissioner of the Kentucky Department for Community-Based Services, and Betty B.J. Atkins, co-leader of the Bounce Coalition, which addresses childhood adversity and resilience in 16 counties in Kentucky. Thank you all very much for being with us to talk about this very important topic. I want to go right to you, Dr. Sprang, because I know this is your life's work. Earlier in this program, we've heard and learned a lot about how toxic stress and traumatized events can really affect our body and our body's stress response system and our mind. So I would like for you to talk to us about how a child who's gone through those traumatic experiences or has suffered a tremendous amount of toxic stress may exhibit behaviors either in the classroom, at home, in the community, with their friends. What what would it look like? So this activation of the stress response that occurs uh, when a child is being consistently exposed to some type of traumatic stimuli can cause some disturbances um, and alterations in the way that they interact with other people and the way they see themselves. So the first thing that usually we see is some alteration in the regulation of affective impulses. So these are kids that just have trouble regulating their moods and their anger, and they can be very self-destructive. So in the classroom or in the community, they may be doing things to destroy property. They may be fighting, engaging in bullying. And quite often um, in this category of um, poor regulation of affective 
impulses we see, um, a lot of really negative behaviors like addiction and self-harming behaviors. And kind of paradoxically, these are um, also the kinds of things that can be life-saving to them because they bring them to the attention of law enforcement, of um, hospitals, of um, child protection, and these are um, intervention points. So we see that um, disruption of um, the ability to regulate these strong feelings. And there's also some alterations in self-perceptions. So there's this um, chronic sense of guilted responsibility. A lot of times they feel intense shame and um, they kind of incorporate that into their sense of self-worth. Mm. So if you're trying to be in a relationship with a child, um, who is having trouble with affect regulation and has these disturbances of self, then you can imagine that you're going to have some difficulty in relationship because they don't feel particularly connected to one to other people. Um, and they have learned that intimacy um, is also associated with betrayal and uh, a violation of trust um, in the most intimate form. The, the people that they counted on um, and that should be trusted um, were people that disappointed them, that hurt them, that violated that trust. So they begin to equate intimacy um, with um, harm and danger. And so that it can also activate their stress response. So I know, Dr. Sprain, that you're very familiar with the old adage that hurt people hurt people. So how much of what a child endures by trauma or child abuse that was delivered by an adult is because that adult has unresolved traumatic experiences of their own? And how do you break that intergenerational cycle? Right. So we know, you know, prevalence rates um, vary because we don't always know uh, when children have been abused. We only know what's reported. Um, but we know about a third of children um, who have this experience of maltreatment will go on to perpetrate harms against their own children. Some of that is social learning. So these are the behaviors uh, that have been modeled for them. This is how they learn that parents interact with children and how uh, men and women talk to each other, how families operate. And so they begin to model that. But there's also uh, a disturbance in systems of meaning where they begin to have altered perceptions of the perpetrator. That even though they despise them, and this is the person that is responsible for hurting them, they begin to incorporate um, some of those behaviors and those ideals and beliefs and behaviors into their own life, like it's their destiny, or this is um, you know, what people like me do. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, um, you know, part of that complex trauma phenomenon that we try to keep an eye on. Commissioner um, Miranda Straub, uh, thank you for being with us. I know you're very busy and we appreciate your time. I, I, I do want to ask you, uh, in your role now at a state level, and you've been so involved in this kind of work for so many years, when you listen to this conversation about adverse childhood experiences, what do you envision that DCBS could do in addressing this on a state policy level? Where do you see your role in helping to mitigate these situations? Situations for vulnerable children. Um, I believe that one of the reasons why I was appointed uh, as commissioner is because I bring 47 years of clinical and organizational uh, experience to this work and an incredible commitment to uh, the depth and breadth that it takes to actually mitigate trauma. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, one of the pieces that the cabinet needs to do that I intend to lead is realizing that um, ACEs is uh, most of adults qualify for ACEs. So one of the initiatives is to really uh, empower, create spaces for the workers who see uh, trauma and who are told the trauma stories and who have to intervene on families in pain and suffering and children who are being hurt. Uh, you can't do that over and over again and not get traumatized. Without addressing that trauma on the worker, that worker is not going to be capable of really, on, an, on a long-term basis, 
being able to stay open, being able to stay uh, supportive, and being able to stay clear that uh, this family needs support and help, and that this child needs support and help. Um, and therefore, that's one of the pieces, one of the ways that I'm beginning to tackle this incredibly complex issue. The other piece is COVID has really allowed us a lot of flexibility. So where we've had a lot of rigidity and bureaucracy, we have been giving uh, opportunities at the federal level and with our partners to be able to be more flexible. We need to create a flexible and nimble return to work for our staff, return to services for our clients. We've been able to expand services uh, because we didn't want people to go through having to apply again uh, three months later. We have been able to move forward on going 200% on SNAP above the poverty rate as opposed to the usual 100 or 130. Uh, lowering the caseload for our work because now 80% of our staff is working from home. So they're able to do more, uh, improve morale as a result of that. Um, so we have an opportunity, and I think we have a short window of time with Governor Bashir, Secretary uh, Freelander, and with COVID and the movement to really uh, eradicate the inequities in our society for the cabinet to join the 21st century and to design uh, trauma response uh, and resilience interventions in flexible and human ways um, that we have not, we would have never been able to do before. Sure. BJ Atkins, thank you for being with us. The Bounce Coalition, I think many people have probably heard about you, but they may not be able to give a definition if you ask them. So I would like for you to define uh, what the mission and the vision of the Bounce Coalition is about. Sure. The uh, mission of the Bounce Coalition is to bring awareness around ACEs with and build skill sets so that our children know how to bounce back with resilience when facing adversity. What we do is we educate and train. We have a rigorous evaluation process. We look at policy needs and advocate for policies no matter where we are. We are in 16 counties in Kentucky right now. So we, we look at those policy needs and we want to have a strong referral source. And we want to make sure that no matter where children go, that they have an adult who can support them that understand the impact of trauma. And BOUNCE is set up for all children. We don't focus on kids with trauma, but from the work, those kids bubble up. We, mm -hmm. be it, the teachers, from what they learned, they can identify those kids because not every child wears trauma through acting out behavior. Some children are very quiet. They sit yeah. in the back of the room. So they're, they're the good children who don't uh, create disturbances in the classroom, but they're in trauma as well. So to spread this out through the community, for example, in Jefferson County, when we did parental engagement, we were able to raise our pilot school PTA from zero members to 213 members, which was really mm -hmm. significant. We grew the parent-teacher counseling by 195%. You know, looking at things as our report cards signed and returned, those were some of the things that said parents are engaged. We had lunch and loans. We had family photograph night. That was an opportunity to educate a lot of people around ACES, a lot of parents, and it was an opportunity for them to take home a photograph of what the family is. And mm -hmm. many people did not have that. So how do you evaluate success? And do you have a success story that you could share? Sure, I, I have uh, more than one, like a school bus driver once. What, that was when we really knew it was reaching home. He was in the compound and another bus driver was telling him he had a student on his bus who was misbehaving terribly and he thought that he would have to suspend him from the bus. And the driver who had been trained asked him, please don't do this until you talk to the counselor because here's a training I went through. Well, the driver with the child who was troubled went to the counselor and the family had intervention because there was abuse going on in the home. Mm. So that's an example mm -hmm. of that awareness and knowledge base for people to help. Another one that touches my heart deeply, one of the teachers 
followed what we had said. And she, to her first grade class, said, if Mrs. Jones only knew, and it was very confidential, but the student could write whatever they wanted on a sheet of paper, what she got back is, if Mrs. Jones only knew, I have to get my sister ready for school. That's why I'm late all the time. Mm. If Mrs. Jones only knew, I live with my grandparents because mom and dad are in jail. If Mrs. Jones only knew, she's the only one that loves me. This came from different children, and these are real scenarios of, of what the teacher received back. That information is golden, mm -hmm. so the teacher knows. So other teachers began incorporating methods to find out. When a child walked into the classroom, one of the first things they did is, on a scale from one to five, how are you today? And a child would report, I'm a two. Maybe one would say, I'm a four. Three, so she knew which children were more troubled. The higher the number, maybe anxiety, whatever was going in that child's world, they didn't have to divulge what it was. Yeah. She knew that child needed some special love that day. And I think, Ms. Atkins, you've helped us realize that we can make tremendous change in subtle ways, right? To uh, not put children on defense, uh, but give them the opportunity to really open up at their own comfort level, just like I wish Mrs. Jones knew. I think that's a great exercise. And having a little bit of that anonymity, maybe at the beginning, just really helps them feel like they can uh, they can open up to a trusted adult. So I, I thank you for sharing. I'd like to go to Commissioner Miranda Straw, perhaps for the, the final word. You know, the, the builder block of self-esteem and well-being is safety. And right now, we have really high numbers in Kentucky. So the first request that I make of all of us is to uh, be safe and make sure that we have enough compassion to care about everyone else. So the first thing is wear a mask, wash your hands, press social distancing, period. My favorite, one of my favorite quotes is what happens to one of us affects all of us. So I'm hoping that the community continues to rally, the state continues to rally, and the country continues to rally around safety, around protective measures, around uh, prevention of pain and trauma and suffering um, so that the next generation has a a healthier place to be born into. Yeah. Those are pretty fine words to end on. Commissioner Marta Miranda Straub, thank you. Dr. Jenny Sprang, thank you. And Bounce Coalition's own Ms. B.J. Atkins, thank you. And not just for being here with us, but for the work that you do to strengthen Kentucky and particularly Kentucky's children. My gratitude. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We hope you now have a greater understanding of the Adverse Childhood Experience Study and the biological impact of toxic stress. And we'll spread the word about this important research. Where the awareness comes a common language and understanding about how to move forward and help heal and prevent the wounds of childhood trauma. To watch this program again and share it with your family and friends, please visit our website at ket.org. As Commissioner Miranda Straub said so very well, the building block of self-esteem and resilience is safety. So please, let's all stay safe and take good care of each other as we navigate these turbulent times and work towards a better future for our children. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Renee Shaw, and take good care.